Hey, Pastor Rob here. Just wanted to thank you for checking out our messages online and wanted to encourage you. I pray that your soul is nourished through the hearing of the word. But at the same time, the writer of Hebrews is very clear about uh, not giving up meeting together. Don't give up the larger gathering. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, the early church made it a point to meet together almost daily even, breaking bread together, encouraging one another, being in communion with one another to build each other up. And, and that is vitally important to your spiritual walk. So I pray that you enjoy this message. But at the same time, I pray that you find a great church body to be a part of, whether that be here at the bridge or somewhere else, so that you can be built up as well. Thank you and God bless. Well, I think it would be foolish if I didn't say uh, this week has been a little different. Huh? Uh, uh, you made it though, and that's awesome. So just go, let's go ahead and just give ourselves a hand for making it. All right? Cool. Hey, um, just to preface and get started this morning, I don't want to blow things way out of proportion and I don't want to overreact here, but it is our responsibility here at the Bridge Church to make sure that your health and safety is at the utmost uh, of the utmost importance. And so to get us started this morning, uh, as we think about this virus that's going around and all the crazy things that have been happening and, and all of the, 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 maybe the sense of fear or maybe even the sense of, man, people were overreacting a little bit. Um, no matter where you stand, you need to know that, uh, uh, we here at the bridge are doing everything we can to make sure that you are safe and that your children are safe and that uh, we, are, we are taking the precautions necessary. So to get us started this morning, uh, I actually just want to start by reading a statement uh, from the church that we wrote on Thursday uh, just to talk about, hey, this, these are the steps that we are taking as a church uh, just to, to make sure that, that your safety is of the utmost importance. Can we just do that first? And then we'll dive into the, to, we'll get back to our regularly scheduled programming after a time of prayer. Does that sound good? All right, well, let me just read this to you. Uh, Bridge family, many of us have watched as the coronavirus disease, otherwise known as COVID-19, has escalated throughout the world. This last Wednesday, the World Health Organization officially declared it a pandemic. The Center for Disease Control is recommending all non-essential international travel cease. Even colleges, universities, and sports leagues are taking drastic precautions by canceling classes and major events to ensure our safety. I realize that many people may have different feelings towards the situation. Some are fearful, while others believe this has been blown out of proportion. No matter where you stand, however, the leadership team at the bridge have a uh, stewardship responsibility to engage in this proactively. So um, first, it's important to know that there are no known cases of the coronavirus in Floyd County as of March 15, 2020, okay? As of March 11, 2020, the known cases in eastern Iowa's Johnson County appear to be cases arising from passengers on the same Egyptian cru cruise ship as others, uh, other cases, and the case in Council Bluffs involves someone who recently traveled to California. Recently, however, the community spread has begun to occur in counties still further south of us, all right? Your health and self safety at the bridge is our priority, and while we don't want everything, uh, while we want to do everything we can not to overreact, it is our responsibility to take precautions. So here are some steps we're taking as of today, okay? Um, first, we do not believe the situation requires us to cancel weekend worship services yet, okay? Uh, we will continue to meet at our normal times, and, and we would encourage you to attend. Secondly, at this time, we're making efforts to look into live streaming and pre-recording our services um, and should the situation arise for us to cancel, okay? Our goal is that if, if we're told that we need to, to, to incubate ourselves in our own households, uh, then uh, we, or, or at least not meet in big groups, then my goal is to at the very least have a pre-recorded service that will be online uh, on social media and our website that will be streaming uh, 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 as of 9 a.m. and 10.45 every Sunday and until we were told otherwise. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, at this time, the Merge Youth Rally on March 20th is still going to occur as planned. Okay? Uh, it, it, it's, I think we, we set an attendance cap of 200 kids. So that was that before the pandemic, and it's now definitely that with the pandemic, okay? So you need to know that at this point in time, as long as the school allows us, we still plan on having the Merge Youth Rally this Friday. Um, that, being the, that being said, it seems as though the canceling that may be imminent. I have no idea. Okay, um, uh, at, so you just need to know that. We've taken extra measures to disinfect all areas, doorknobs, toys, and services of the Bridge Church. We've also have plenty of toilet paper, okay? <laughs> 
Uh, so you just need to know those things. Uh, can we just give a hand to our welcome team and kids ministry? They spent between services disinfecting the whole building. And I just think they need to, they need to deserve some, some encouragement for that. Can we just do that? Okay. Man, you guys, you guys have no idea. You have no idea how thankful I am for the people that, that work and volunteer at this church. I had to say one word to them and they said, don't worry about it, Rob, we got it. And I didn't have to think another thing about it. And we've got a great, great team here of people that genuinely care about connecting people to God. And I know all of you are the same. And so I just want to take a minute and just thank God for them and, and their willingness to serve in such big ways. I know every, almost every single person in this room is already doing that for our church that we might minister to our community. And I just, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, uh, lastly, if you've taken an international trip in the past two weeks, boarded a cruise ship, or visited a city that has active reported cases of COVID-19, we hope you aren't here with us this morning. Uh, if so, we would respectfully ask you to leave and would advise you in line with CDC to observe a two-week incubation excuse me, two-week isolation period during the incubation phase, they call it, to ensure your safety as well as others. In other words, Please enjoy our messages online the next few weeks as you do that. Um, if you have any symptoms such as fever, cough, shortness of breath, you're encouraged to stay home as well. And as you may have already noticed, we are limiting, we are limiting handshaking, hugging, and other direct contact in uh, the coming weeks to avoid this situation until it's subsided. This doesn't mean that we aren't thrilled to see you or that we don't love you. It's just a necessary precaution during this phase. So if you want to keep more informed, you can go to cdc.gov. All right, are we clear? Does everybody make, that makes sense to everybody? Um, should cases be reported here in Floyd County or even other counties within our proximity, the conversation will change, okay? If other cases are report, reported near, nearer to us, the, the conversation will change. Things seem to be rapidly um, uh, changing over just a 24-hour period. So we'll do all we can to keep you up to date. You can check our website. You can check our Facebook page. And my goal is to also potentially uh, put something on YouTube. Um, right now, we do not have an Instagram account, but we're working on that. So uh, we'll see. Maybe this situation will encourage us to get that uh, in motion. In the meantime, let's do all we can to follow the CDC recommendations. Wash our hands, which you should be doing already. Uh, coffer, uh, cover our coughs and sneezes with our sleeves. Clean items you're in direct contact with, such as a cell phone, and stay home when you are ill, okay? So this is the last word I want to give to you. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and self-control, Okay? The Bridge Church should exemplify those things to the utmost in Charles City. Amen? You have a responsibility, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, to put your stake in the ground of Jesus Christ and the foundation of him, okay? And I'm not trying to overreact here. I'm trying to say, hey, we should be a hope and a light as a church. Amen? Like, we should, we should be praying, not panicking. Amen? Amen? We should be doing everything we can to serve, not hoard. Amen? Amen? We should be doing everything we can to be a light, not more darkness. Okay? And that's my prayer for you this morning. Over the coming weeks, we'll adjust as things uh, require us to. I would encourage you of uh, two big things. Uh, three big things. Let's say three big things. I want you to pray over this situation. Whether you think it's an overreaction or not, you need to be praying because there are people losing their lives to this disease. It is a fact, okay? Number two, um, I want you to make sure you're checking out services online and creating community, okay? I had one pastor, I listened to him this morning as he reported to his church. He said, we will be suspending services. We will sus be suspending church. We will not be canceling church. Do you know why he said that? Because you can't cancel church. You are the church, amen? We are the church, and we will be the church, okay? And so check out services online and be a ministry, ministry to those around you. And finally, uh, make sure you're still tithing and giving to the church, okay? We are a nonprofit. We survive and thrive on your, on your generosity. So this is an awesome opportunity for you to sign up for online giving, okay? So uh, go ahead and, and, and do everything you can to do that for us, and it would be a huge blessing to us. Uh, a. W. To I, I, will, I will conclude with this. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, a scared world needs a fearless church. I don't think I could have said it better. A scared world needs a fearless church. Let's be that church. Amen? Amen. Come on, church. Amen? Amen.
All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for the opportunity that we do have to worship today, God. Believe it or not, <laughs> we could not have that opportunity. It's a possibility right now. But Lord, you've allowed us to gather together. You've allowed us to come together as one. And God, the, the hardest part about this situation is that um, we need community. And sometimes the best solution for isolation is community, God. And um, Lord, we may or may not have that taken away from us, but Lord, no matter what, you are on your throne, you are in control. And uh, Lord, what I pray this week, even as we dive into the message this morning, which I think this message is perfect, absolutely perfect for the time that we are in, Lord. Um, God, I pray that we would be a ministry, that we would be the hands and feet of your son, Jesus, that we would, not, that we would pray, not panic, that we would serve, not hoard, that we would uh, uh, be a ministry to every single person we come in contact with, Father, that we would be a firm foundation for people to lean on as we lean on your son, Jesus Christ, God. We pray for our country. We pray for our elected officials. We pray for our medical officials. We pray for the nurses and the staff and uh, all of the nursing homes, specifically in our town, Lord, um, hearing about the lockdown that they're in and, and thinking about the residents that, um, I was just talking to a worker this morning from Chautauqua and, uh, Lord, her report was that, um, the residents are getting restless because they haven't had anybody to visit them recently. Um, and so Lord, I just pray a, a spirit of peace would come upon those homes and those people. Father, you are in con control and your Holy Spirit can give us a peace that transcends all understanding. So Lord, I pray that every believer in our nation would sense that and feel that and be an example, uh, an example of that, Father. Lord, we know that you uh, have the power and, and the grace and the wisdom to help us to get through this. So may it be that that works through us in the name of your son, Jesus, and the power of your spirit. We pray in faith, not fear. And all God's people said as loud and proud as they said, amen. Good stuff. Well, I got a couple of announcements for you guys today before we dive into uh, all the stuff that, uh, before we dive into everything. First off, my name is Rob Williams. If you don't know me, my name's Rob, and, and I've been the lead pastor here at The Bridge for about four years now, and uh, we are so glad to have you here today. If you are new with us, we want to welcome you to go ahead and grab one of these blue cards from the chair racks in front of you. Uh, uh, here at The Bridge, we believe it's our job to connect people to God, and the best way we can do that is by connecting with you first. So please, please, please grab one of these welcome cards um, and, and fill it out. Out, and then take it back to our welcome center after service, and we have an awesome free gift we would like to give you for doing that. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, we, we're just glad you're here, okay? I've got a few announcements for you. Uh, at this time, the Merge Youth Rally is going on as planned. If, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, the Merge Youth Rally is this Friday and Saturday. It's an all-night lock-in that we're putting on at, Mill at the, the Charles City Middle School. And let me correct myself, we are not putting it on. All local area churches are putting on Merge this year. And we're really excited about it. So if you are a teen, you know a teen, you have a teen, any kind of teen you got, okay? Make sure to go to mergerally.com and get them signed up. Uh, we really, really would love to have them there. We've got a speaker coming all the way from Washington to, to share with them. And we are really, really excited about this night. It should be a great time together. And, and unless the schools prevent us, we plan on having it, okay? Um, the, the, the cap for the Merge Youth Rally is 200 people, so we should be good. And also next week, uh, next Sunday night, we have a membership class, a number number of you been asking about membership class? Hey, when's the next one? How can we get in, in on it? Well, here's your opportunity. You can go to our website and get registered online. March 22nd is the date. Um, there is free pizza in the middle. And some of you guys are going, Rob, I'm not sure I want to go into membership, but I've been thinking about it. Hey, just come check it out. Just because you take the class doesn't mean you're required to come beca become a member. Come for the free pizza. Come to learn about the Wesleyan Church and who we are as a bridge church. And, uh, uh, you know, if, if you're not interested, you can abstain from signing up. And if you, hopefully you'll be inspired to and be excited to, to, to join in and take ownership for what's going on here at the bridge. And we want to implore you to do so. Finally, this last event I'm really excited about, it's called the Westwood Benefit Brunch. And this is actually something that our men's ministry department came up with. A couple guys named Justin uh, Murphy and John Jenkins uh, thought it would be an awesome idea to partner with the community and do everything we could to raise money for, uh, the, for, for Westwood Park. Now, many of us know Westwood Park as... Oak Park, okay? Oak Park, so all, all the Charles City uh, uh, OG knew what that was. But anyways, uh, 
The Westwood Benefit Brunch, uh, uh, we're really, really excited about this. Uh, if you've ever been over there, you'll notice that the bathrooms are a little dilapidated and that the bleachers need some work and a few other things. And uh, so what we've decided to do is, uh, Justin and John came up with this great idea of throwing a big fundraiser. And our goal is to raise $10,000 that we might be able to fix up the bathrooms as well as replace the bleachers. And we are really, really excited about this event because this is also gonna be an Easter outreach event, okay? That's what we're excited about because we're gonna have a ton of people in our building, having breakfast with us, and then we're also going to be putting out Easter invites. Say, hey, if you don't got anywhere to go for Easter, come to the bridge. We really, really want you here. So uh, if you don't have this date marked down on your calendar, please do so. And if you're a guy, just do me a favor. If you're a man, raise your hand. Come on. Come on. All right. If you just raised your hand, sign up at the Welcome Center on your way out, okay? Uh, we could use your help putting that breakfast together, serving it, at, uh, making the food, etc. cetera. Um, we are really, really excited about this event because this is an opportunity for us as the Bridge Church to say, hey, we care about this community so much that we're willing to put our money where our mouth is. Amen? Amen. So I hope you can make it. We're inviting the entire town to this thing. We're putting it all over Facebook. Share it on social media. Invite your friends. Make sure they show up. We can't wait for this event to happen, all right? That's everything I've got for you. So why don't we go ahead and dive into the message. This week, we are in week two of this series called Disciple. Last week, we kicked it off by talking about the, the fact that this whole series is about what it looks like to, to be spiritually formed into a disciple of Jesus Christ, okay? And and uh, the first stage we talked about was the show me stage. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But today we're going to be getting into stage two. And I want to start this morning by asking you a question, okay? Do you remember the first time you ever drove a car? Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm already hearing giggles. Okay. I'm already hearing giggles. Do you remember the first time you drove a car? How about this? Do you remember who taught you how to drive that car? You remember that? Okay. Yeah. All right. How about this? Was it a stick shift or an automatic? All right, so if it was an automatic, raise your hand, okay? If it was an automatic, okay, so those are the weak ones. Put your hands down, all right? If it was a stick shift, raise your hand. Oh, yeah, see, I was a stick shift guy, all right? Good stuff, all right. Now, let me ask this. Was it a relaxing experience for you or was it a terrifying experience for you? Oh, never mind. It was probably more, t more terrifying for the person teaching you. Don't worry about it, okay. Okay. Um, my dad was the one who taught me, because my mom's like, uh-uh, I ain't having any of that, right? My dad was the one who taught me how to drive. Th thankfully, most of it came pretty natural to me. Driving has always been something that came pretty natural to me. Something I like to brag about is the first time I parallel parked, it was, a, when it was in a, I think it was a 2005 Chevy Silverado, and I parallel parked it on the first shot. That was, my, that was my big pride thing about, about driving. Um, I, you know, I, it came pretty natural to me, but that doesn't mean that everything was perfect when I learned how to drive. As I thought about it this week, I'd say my driving experience probably actually started when I was about 11 or 12 years old. My first driving experience actually probably started in my dad's uh, 2000 Kia Sportage, believe it or not, okay? Now, don't get me wrong, he didn't let me drive the car at that age, okay? I wasn't near tall enough at that point to even reach the pedals, but he did teach me the H pattern. Okay, and what I mean by that is my dad, uh, his Kia Sportage was a stick shift and he taught me how to shift his truck or his SUV, whatever you want to call it. And so he'd run the steering wheel and the pedals and I got to shift the truck, right? Now, as I think about it, I realize that's probably one of those things that my dad like let me do as a kid. You know, for those of you that have kids, you know how sometimes you, you give your kids that, that one special privilege, that one time, right? And then you regret it for the rest of your life, right? <laughs> Because then every time dad and I got in the truck, what did I say? Dad, can I shift? Dad, can I shift? Dad, can I shift? Right? And it drove him nuts. But um, that's probably where my, my driving experience actually began. And then that eventually evolved into me, uh, my dad driving, sitting, me sitting on my dad's lap, and we drove around our local fairgrounds or Kmart parking lot even. And my dad would still operate the pedals but I got in, in the stick shift, but I would operate the steering wheel. Right? And then until eventually I turned 14. And when I turned 14, uh, my dad was probably a little too brave the day I got my permit. Anybody remember the day you got your permit? Okay, how many of you guys completely skipped the permit? Raise your hand. All right. Man, I don't, I don't understand y'all. Like, I, dude, the day I turned 16, I already had my car bought. That's how excited I was about driving, okay? Um, but, uh, you know, the day I got my permit, my dad let me drive out of the DOT parking lot. I mean, that was how, how excited and confident he was for me. Although I came to the realization that he was probably a little too confident because you got to realize that the, driving out of the DOT parking lot in Des Moines isn't like driving out into Charles City traffic, okay? 
The DOT parking lot in Des Moines is about three or four minutes north of Des Moines, okay? The downtown area, I'm talking, all right? And so when you're pulling out into traffic, you're not just pulling out into traffic, you're pulling out into four lanes of traffic packed with cars and lights and commotion and all kinds of stuff going on, okay? And, and I remember having that kind of excited but also terrified and nervous attitude as I was sitting behind the, da- the, the, the wheel of my dad's uh, Toyota Tundra, okay? And uh, as natural as driving came to me, sometimes my excitement and ADHD got the best of me, right? And, and this very first time driving would actually resemble that because the very first thing I did as I pulled out into traffic was pull through a red light. That was the very first thing I did in my fir- very first driving experience. Today, we're in week two of our series called Disciple. And last week, I opened my message by talking about my dad again. And in doing so, this week and last, I've come to realize that much of what I've learned probably came from my dad because he really discipled me as a kid. I mean, honestly, my dad discipled me as a kid. If you think about it, the purest definition of a disciple is someone who learns, follows, and champions the beliefs of another. So when you look at that definition, I'll be honest with you, I don't know exactly where the series is going, but don't be surprised if I keep talking about my father for that very reason, because I learned and followed my dad even more than I realized before I began writing this series. When we come to think of it, though, we've all had someone disciple us in one way or another, haven't we? I mean, every single one of us have had someone disciple us in one way or another. Well, whether they discipled us into good things and good habits or discipled us into bad things and bad habits or, or maybe ornery ab- habits, you know what I mean? Like, like, like pranks and things like that. The things we learned growing up probably came from someone. Who was that person for you? Take a second and think about that. Who was it that discipled you, whether it was in Christianity or not? Who was it you learned everything from? What did they teach you? How did they impact you? As we dig into the series called Disciple, I think that it's important that we recognize those who have discipled us, those who have shown us how to make it in this life, and especially those who have shown us who Jesus is. That's where this series started. The whole idea behind this series is to look at what the formation of a disciple looks like. And that formation usually starts with someone showing us who God is, amen? I mean, someone showed us who Jesus was and who he is. Maybe for some of you, it, was, it wasn't someone other than God himself. Maybe, maybe God showed himself to you before anyone else did in the beginning, but regardless, someone showed you who God was, whether it was him or someone else. In the book of Mark, we see Jesus take the apostles through a process of growth and development that we can almost break down into four stages. He's showing the uh, the apostles what it's like to follow him and live for God. Last week, we dug into stage one, which is the show me stage. You can find this stage in the first four chapters of the book of Mark. And what we see Jesus call the disciples to uh, uh, and follow him to do. You see, Jesus calls them to follow him and they do it and they're obedient. But what we came to realize last week is that during the first four chapters of Mark, the disciples didn't really have to trust Jesus with much, right? When a rabbi came and approached you and asked you to follow him, it was cultural for you to drop everything and follow him at that point. So what they dropped wasn't that big a deal. And quite honestly, they could have gone back to their trade, right? You think about the story where the, the disciples were mending their nets and Jesus says, come and follow me and I will make you, disi- make you fishers of men. And the disciples don't hesitate. They drop everything they're doing and they follow Jesus. But the reality is they could have gone back to that. And they didn't have to really trust Jesus with much until you get to the end of chapter four. Because when you get to the end of chapter four of Mark, you see Jesus and the disciples in the boat. And the storm and the wind and the waves start to kick up. And all of a sudden they go from trusting Jesus with very little to having to trust Jesus with their entire lives. They have to trust him with everything at that point. Something we learned last week is that trust, contrary to culture, is actually given, not earned. Contrary to culture, what culture may think, trust is given, not earned. You know what's, diser- you, you, you know what's, what's earned? Distrust. Distrust is really what's earned. Man, right now, we're living in a time where we are, where our trust in God is going to be put to the test. Amen? I mean, we are going to be put to the test in this situation that we're in. I don't know where you're at. 
But I can assure you of this. Your trust in Jesus will take you much further than anything else in this world will. Let me say that again. We are at a time where your trust in Jesus will take you much further than anything else. And quite frankly, it already did. Much, much further. We have to trust Jesus with our lives, no matter what's going on around us. I pray that you're able to do that, not just for your sake, but for the sake of others today, or for the sake of others as well. Today, we're going to be diving into stage two of the formation of a disciple. Like we said, Jesus spent the first part of his ministry simply showing and doing all he could to show the disciples who he was. The purpose of this was to build a relationship with the disciples, because he knew they weren't going to trust him if they didn't have a relationship, and, with, and help them realize that he could be trusted. But once they begin to trust them with their li- him with their lives, he's able to move them on to bigger and better things. And this is something that should connect with you completely and directly and, and in many ways. Many of you here today have been following Jesus at a distance. You've been watching and learning and observing, but now God's calling you to take a leap and trust. God's calling you to take a leap and trust. And what you need to know is this. As you've been following Jesus at a a distance, God's been saying this. Listen, I've got more planned for you than just songs and sermons. I've got more planned for you than just songs and sermons. And it's time for you to step in and start trusting God with your life. Christianity is about more than showing up on Sunday morning to learn about God. It's about more than just being fed. It's about more than just getting your Jesus fix on Sunday so you can eventually go back to your regular life. And we see evidence of this as Jesus continues to develop his disciples and we move along in the book of Mark. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 6, okay? If you, uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or you don't have an app for that, then go ahead and grab one of these black Bibles from the chair racks in front of you. Um, Once again, we're going to be in Mark chapter 6. If you don't know how to get there, I will help you. Um, The book of Mark is in the New Testament, which is near the back part of your Bible. If you go about two-thirds to three-quarters of the way near the back, you should land in Matthew and then Mark. If you've hit Luke or John, you've gone too far. Picking things up where we left off last week after Jesus and the disciples crossed the lake, they're immediately approached by a man who's possessed by demons, okay? After casting those demons into a herd of pigs, Jesus then heals a woman by her simply touching his clothes. And then finally, as he's walking to where he's going, he eventually gets to a point where he's able to raise the daughter of a synagogue ruler back from the dead. I mean, it's just another day in the life of Jesus, right? Right? It's just a Tuesday, But then as we get to chapter 6, something unique happens. Because Jesus goes back to his hometown to minister to the people there. And get this. The people he grew up with don't trust him. The people he went back to home, back home to see, don't get it. He's saying, that he's the Messiah, but the people only recognize him as Joseph and Mary's boy. And they don't believe he is who he says he is. And what's crazy is what we read in in verse 5 of chapter 6, okay? In verse 5 of chapter 6, this is what it says. He, Jesus, could not do any miracles there. What? He could not do any miracles there except to lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. You know what I think happened here? I think that Jesus, I don't think Jesus was incapable of performing miracles. I think he was too dumbfounded to. I mean, honestly, the passage says that he was amazed. And I think that as much as he was amazed, he was also discouraged and heartbroken by the lack of faith coming from the people in his own town. Scripture says that Jesus was fully God and fully man, and I think that that human side was was so heartbroken here, was so dumbfounded that it was hard for him to overcome. I mean, the people Jesus grew up with, the kids he probably played with, the men he may have worked with, the family and friends he feasted with, didn't believe him. They couldn't see him for who he was. And I imagine this overwhelmed Jesus a bit. Not long after that incident, Jesus makes a shift. Jesus makes a change. 
You see, not long after that incident, he begins to send the disciples out two by two. He begins to send them out to do the work themselves. And they're amazed at what they can accomplish with the power of God in them. It says this, they went out and preached that the, and the people, excuse me, they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with, all, with oil and healed them. You see, when we get to this point in chapter 6, something changes. Jesus doesn't, show the disciples, doesn't just show the disciples anymore. He looks at them and says, hey, now it's your turn. Hey, now it's your turn. He sends them out two by two to preach and heal the people. And, and so they go off into villages and, and, and it says that they're preaching and people are repenting and they're casting out demons from people. I mean, just not a bad day for the disciples, right? I mean, that's pretty awesome. We're talking about some really successful ministry. And this is where stage two of the formation of a disciple takes place because this is the let me stage. This is the let me stage. Or some of us might even call it the use me stage. This is the part where God uses me. This is where the disciple has observed long enough and now it's time for them to do it themselves. You've shown me Jesus, now let me do it. And they're excited. When they get back to Jesus, they're amazed and the text says they tried to report everything that had happened. There's, there's something really thrilling about moving from the role of a spectator to the player on the field. And not only did the disciples get put in the game, but they did a really great job. In fact, it says that King Herod heard about what was going on. The king found out what they were doing because it was creating such a stir. These guys are having an impact. They're making an impact. Man, if I want anything in my life, I want to make an impact. Don't you? I mean, I just want to make an impact in my community. I want to make an impact. I want to make a dent in people's lives in a good way, not a bad way. And here's the cool part. And maybe you, many of you, you have experienced this. There's something amazing and thrilling about using, being used by God, isn't there? I mean, there's nothing comparable to it. I remember the first time I witnessed to somebody, it was actually on a plane, okay? Just to be stereotypical, okay? It seems like all the preachers always minister every, everybody on planes. I was on my way back from Swaziland, Africa, and I was on this big spiritual high. I mean, I was just so excited. And I remember coming back and I was just started witnessing to people on the plane and telling them about Jesus because I was so just amazed at how God had used me when we were on that missions trip. And you know what happened? Like God started bringing scripture passages and things to my head that I'd never memorized in my life. And the Holy Spirit started using me to say things I'd never said before and I never thought of before and I never e even known I could do. It was incredible how God used me. And it, there's just nothing more thrilling than being, knowing that, man, that could have only been the Holy Spirit. Like I literally got off that plane and went, I don't know what I just said. <laughs> but I know it was good. At this point in the language for the disciples, in chapter 6, verse 30 of the text, which is where we're going to pick things up in a minute here, you recognize that the language changes. You see, instead of calling them disciples, now they're called apostles. Apostle, an apostle is a messenger. They weren't just there to be students or learners now. Now they were going out and doing the work and they're doing a great job. In fact, the crowds start to recognize them. And when they sailed across the lake, the text shifts in the language as well because it says that the crowd saw them leaving and they recognized them and then they followed them, not just Jesus. It's not just about Jesus anymore. It's about Jesus and the disciples together. People are recognizing all of them. You see, the show me stage is where we watch while the let me stage is where we do. And God is calling us to not just watch him, but to be used by him. Amen, church? God's calling us to be used by him. And the culmination of this stage occurs near the end of the middle of chapter six, starting in verse 30. So let's just read this together. We're gonna read quite a few verses here, so buckle up. Here we go, starting in verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So there's a bunch of commotion going on around them. You ever try to have a conversation in a crowd, 
right? It's difficult. So Jesus is like, you know what? We haven't even gotten dinner yet. Let's, let's go across the lake. Let's get away from everybody. Let's figure things out, okay? So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But this is where the people saw them, right? Many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so the disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. And this is the very key part in this passage. But Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. He says, you do it. They said to him, that would take more than a half year's wages. Are we going to go, uh, are we to go and spend that much br money on bread and, and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven Jesus gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. 5,000. So the disciples, after being sent out in twos, try to report everything to Jesus. There's too much commotion and they end up having to leave, right? As they're reporting this to him, they decide, you know what? Jesus goes, you guys, I can't hear you. I can't, under you're like, let's, let's get away. Let's go grab something to eat. Let's, let's chill out, right? And uh, we'll talk about this in, in a little bit here. So they hop in the boat and they try to go to a solitary place, but the crowds follow them. And, and Jesus has compassion on these crowds when they land the boat. And so he just starts teaching them again. But then it begins to get pretty late. And people haven't eaten yet, so the disciples encourage Jesus to send the people away. And Jesus says something here that I think is easily missed, especially if you've heard the story before. In verse 37, what's Jesus say? He says, you give them something to eat. Now, many of us know this story. Maybe we heard it growing up in Sunday school, or we've heard it a hundred times in church. We, we, we know that eventually Jesus feeds them, and that's what we highlight in the story, right? This crazy miracle that Jesus did. But first, he tells the apostles to do it. Now, there were thousands of people there, and it's easy for us to, to place ourselves in the, the, the position of the apostles, right? Well, that would be impossible. Like, that's crazy. What are you talking about, Jesus? Jesus. but what if they had tried? Like, like what would have happened if they had tried? We don't know that. We learned something really big here, really, really big here that spans across all of Christianity. And, 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 I, and I don't want us to miss this this morning. Whatever it is that God's trying to lead you to do, you need to know this. He can do it, but he'd rather use you. Sure, God's got all the power and the majesty, and, and he's got the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's omnipresent, and he's omniscient, and all the other omnis that you can think of, right? But he'd rather use you. He'd rather use you. He'd rather see you step out in your faith because he wants to grow you and mold you and shape you as an individual. And he wants you to be the hands and feet of Jesus to this world. What a perfect message for today. God can do it. He can minister to others. He can pour blessing out on our nation. He can perform hundreds of miracles, but he'd rather use you. And he knows that in certain situations, he may even lead you to take faith-filled risks, but it's only for your good 
and it's all for his glory. Can I tell you something? The, the most pivotal and influential moments of my faith journey came when I took a risk for Jesus. I mean, when I took a huge risk for Jesus. The first one came when I was in high school. Um, it was my junior year of high school, and I had just recently given my life over to God, and, and I was getting ready to go into my senior year, and I was in line to become the rifle team captain and the drum, one of the leaders in the drum line, and I was in line to do a lot of things in my school, and I felt God telling me, no, you need to go to a Christian school for your last year so that you can be molded and shaped into what I want you to be. So I dropped everything. I said, all right, God, I'm doing that for you. I dropped all of my passions and went to a different school so that I could be used elsewhere. And, get, and it paid off. How about when I went to college? Um, I was planning on going to a university called Indiana Wesleyan University. Um, I was really, really excited about it. Um, it's, in, it's in Marion, Indiana. It's about eight hours away. But instead, my pastor approached me and said, hey, let me tell you about another college that's got a lot less tuition cost and just as good of a degree, if not better. And I went 30 hours away instead of eight for college. And I went into a completely different country. I went to Canada to go to college, and I met my bride there. I'd say that paid off, okay? <laughs> Brownie points, okay. Uh, she's not in here this service. She was here first service, and I didn't say it then. Rob, come on. Okay. How about, how about this one? I came to Charles City, and I felt so unprepared and so unworthy and so clueless as to what it meant to be a lead pastor of a church. And I'd say that one paid off because of the amazing people we have in this room this morning. God can do it, but he'd rather use you. And we're going to come to realize, we're going to talk about this later a little bit more, some of the most pivotal and influential and impactful moments of your life come when you take faith-filled risks for Jesus. You see, I think there are huge lessons that we can learn in the let me stage um, that we can't learn in any, in any other stage, okay? And the first lesson that we can learn in the, the let me stage is this. Are you ready? You will never feel equipped to be used by God. You will never feel equipped to be used by God. Jesus told the disciples, you feed them. And the disciples were incredulous. They don't know what to do. It would, it would take half our, our salary to buy enough food to feed them. And, and this is what's awesome. This is like my favorite part of the whole passage. What does Jesus do? He says, well, what do you got? What do you got? Five loaves, two fish. I can use that. I can use that, he says. You will never feel equipped. It never, I think it's so easy for us all to believe this lie that we don't have what it takes to help someone or to love someone or share the gospel with someone or to even invite somebody to church. I think it's so easy to think that we could never um, do what Pastor Rob or what Pastor Joe does. But in reality, I'll be honest with you, I think there's some people in our congregation that could probably do a better job at this job than me, right? But God hasn't called you to that. The reality is, is that God's called you to do a hundred other things. And I think that's awesome, but he's also called you to minister to, your, to, to your, the people within your proximity and within your job and within your community. And let me tell you, you will never feel equipped, just like I didn't feel equipped when I stepped into this position. You will never feel equipped. And even if you couldn't do this job, God's got a hundred other things for you to do. He wants you or someone else to do whatever it is you can do. And some of you guys are going, well, Rob, you don't understand. I just don't got what it takes. You're right. You don't. You don't have what it takes. But Jesus is looking at you right now and asking, well, what do you got? Because I can use that. You may not have what it takes, but Jesus does. And he's going to give you what you need. And not once in history has God called someone who was equipped to do something. He doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't use the, the got-it-togethers. He uses the broken and the lost. 
And he says, I know you don't got it together, but I'm going to get it together for you. You think you don't got your poop in a group, but I'm going to take care of it for you. Don't worry about it. We're going we're gonna to figure this out together. But I got to know that you're going to believe in me first. I need you to take the first step. And here's the scary part, okay? You'll never feel equipped, and you will, you will fail. How about that for an encouraging message? Woohoo! Right? You're going to fail. Who knows what would have happened if the apostles had attempted to feed all those people? They might have succeeded or they may have failed. The disciples failed multiple times during the time of Jesus' ministry. In Matthew 17, we read of a story where a man approaches Jesus about his demon possessed son. And do you know what he says to them? What he says to Jesus? He said, I brought my son to your disciples, but they could not heal him. They couldn't do it. In other words, they failed. And sometimes stepping out in faith for God includes failure. The disciples failed all the time. Peter was the epitome of someone who failed. He tried and tried and failed a number of times, which is probably why I relate to him so much. When you step out and take courage to do something for God, not everything's going to be a success. It's a fact. And quite frankly, not everything is meant to be a success. Something I've been trying to teach my kids, and I say this all the time, uh, I look them in the eyes and I say, kids, why do we fail? And they say, so we can learn. Kids, why do we fall? So we can get back up and try again. Why do we fail so we can learn? Failure doesn't mean that nothing happened, nothing good happened. Failure is how we learn and grow and how God changes us and matures us. How about this one? This is a big one, and some of you guys are going to be like, Rob, you're a heretic, but just go with me, okay? Are you ready? I believe that sometimes God sets us up to fail. And this is where things get a little dangerous. I love the passage in Philippians that says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But then sometimes I can't. How about that? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, but, but I would say that, you know what, sometimes I also can't. Whoa, Rob, that's heresy. That's not scriptural. I mean, that's the most quoted scripture passage in all of social media, right? Absolutely, it's scriptural. Just because I can do all things through Christ doesn't mean I will do all things through Christ. In the book of Acts, Paul wanted to do all kinds of things all kinds of things that the Spirit wanted him to. And he failed. It literally says the Holy Spirit prevented him from doing that. And that's okay. Because it's in those moments that we fail that God grows us the most. Amen? I mean, that God grows our faith and, and forces us to grow in maturity. And it's the times where God doesn't come through and we trust still that our faith grows even more. All right, to keep on our line of inspiration this morning, let me get to lesson number three. Are you ready? You will never feel equipped. You are, never, you are definitely going to fail. And not only that, you will never have enough strength or power to accomplish the things of God. You won't. But he will. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and he's talking to them about this. Um, he's talking to them about this thorn in his flesh, this obstacle that he can't seem to overcome that's been placed in his life. He can't seem to get rid of it. Some people think he's talking about sin, while others think he's actually talking about a literal thorn that's in his side. But this is what it says. It says, three times I pleaded with, pleaded with God or the Lord to take it away from me. But God said this, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in what? Weakness. Therefore, I boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, 
and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties and coronaviruses. <laughs> For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. You won't, but he will. Paul said he gladly boasts in the weaknesses so that, the scripture passage says so that, therefore I will boast all the more weak gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. God may be asking you to do something or confront someone or step into a situation that you just don't think you have the power to do and you'd be right. But it's not about your power, it's about his promise, amen? And it's time for you to step into it. So let me ask you this. As you learn these lessons, as you come to realize that you're, not, you're never gonna feel equipped or that you're always gonna, not that you're always gonna fail, that you, but the fact that you are gonna fail and that you'll never have enough power or strength, let me now ask you this. With all, knowing all of those things, what is one step you can take into the work of God this week? What's one thing you can do in the coming weeks as our nation deals with everything that it's going through right now? What's one thing you can do to be an inspiration and a light? I mean, come on, church. The darker this world gets, the brighter his light can shine. Come on, church. What is one step that you can take into the work of God this week? God wants to use you. What is it that you need to do? Where is it that you need to go? Who is it that you need to turn to? Who is it that you need to talk to or serve or just be present for? How is it that God wants to use you in the midst of trial and tribulation? Just take a minute and think about that. I can think, I, I bet almost immediately some of you have things coming to your mind. Take a minute and think about it. What is one thing that I can do to step into God's work this week? Whether it's filling out a red card near, so that you can serve here at the church, or better yet, better yet, serving in your community, or just being cognizant of the people around you when you're in the grocery store, they're in a panic. What can you do to serve and love people and be a ministry in this time? What a perfect message for today. God wants to use you. I want you to think about three things. Who, what, and when. You can write that down. I didn't put it in your outlines. Who, what, and when. Who is you, okay? The who is you. This, is, this, is, this, is, this comes from a book called The Principles of Execution. The who is you. We already know the who, right? What is it that God's calling you to do? What's he asking you to do? What, what, what are you seeing that you can, that you can be the, the answer to someone's prayer, okay? So who, what, and when? When are you going to do it? Put a date on it. Because if you don't, you're not going to do it. Who, what, and when? Write it down. Put a date on it and hold yourself to it. How about this? As our country is going through this global crisis, how can you be a ministry to others? Are you hoarding supplies or donating them? Are you being wise or or destructive with your social media presence and interactions? Are you being an encouragement or a discouragement? Are you being light or darkness? What are you doing to contribute to the mission of connecting people to God in a place that could potentially be darker than we may realize? then we may even see with our own eyes because we know that we're living with an eternal perspective and we know that no matter what happens, God's got us. Can I tell you something? There's a lot of people in this world that don't have that. They're terrified right now. They don't know what's next. 
and they're holding on to what they got with everything that they have. Folks, if you're a believer in the ro this room this morning, we don't have to worry about that. We know the one true king is on his throne and he is in control. He is in control. Now here's the exciting part, okay? When you step out to do the work of God, I promise you, you will experience some of the most faith-filled and exhilarating moments of your life with Jesus. I mean, you will. When you give without expecting to receive, when you serve without expecting to be served, when you step up when, when in situations where God's calling you to step up and you've got nothing to catch you if you fall. I mean, nothing. Right? Faith, the best thing I like to, the thing I like to compare faith the most to is doing a backflip. Okay? You ever do a backflip in a pool? Some of y'all are like, no, Rob, I'm not crazy like you. Right? I remember when I was a kid, I used to learn how to do, I was learn, trying to learn how to do a backflip. Right? And the biggest struggle with me learning how to do a backflip was like, forgive me here, but you, you stand on the edge of the pool, right? And you like bounce, right? And, and then you, you know, the, the, the hardest part is throwing yourself back. I'm not going to do it now, okay? Uh, throwing yourself back without flailing like a chicken before you smack on the water. I did that about a hundred times before I could ever do a backflip. Do you know why? Because you can't see where you're going. And it's not until you're upside down and completely out of control that that backflip becomes a reality, right? Do you know how many people aren't able to do that because they don't have the faith in this life to carry them? They don't have the trust in the, their holy God that he's gonna bring them all the way around? It's your job to be that light, folks. It's your job to step in and step up and, and ask God, God, let me do it. How can I be the hands and feet of Jesus? God wants you, he wants to use you. And when you're obedient to him, he will take what you've got and not only will he use it, he will multiply it tenfold because of your faith in his kingdom. Paul said this to the church in Rome. He said, the spirit of God who raised you from the dead lives in you. So what are you going to do about it, church? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for, um, God, the exhilaration that we can experience in being used by you, Father. Um, no matter where our, our world turns, um, <clears throat> we know that the darker it may seem, the brighter your light can shine, and the more powerful you can become in the presence of others, Lord. And honestly, the more powerful we can become. And so, Lord, we pray uh, over this spirit of fear, God. We cast it out in the name of your son, Jesus. And we pray in faith that we would, we would be a people of faith, that we would be a people of power and love and self-control and light and, and, and kindness and gentleness and, and self-control, Lord. Just, just help us to be the people that you've called us to be, to display the, the, the works of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit in a time when it seems impossible, Father. We pray this in the inspiration of your Holy Spirit in the name of your Son, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Be sent, church. Have a great week. I might see you next week. I might not. God bless. <laughs>